Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. Christmas Eve is never enough. Mary, Mary, she thought and she pondered. And that's why I love Christmas Day. We get to come back just a few hours later after Christmas Eve and sink into this truth that God became one of us. And I want to invite you into that right now. Please stand as we celebrate Christ for us. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. But the angels said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened. He will judge the world in righteousness in the people's with equity. Please be seated. We'll join in singing our opening hymn.
bring Jesus, the Son of God and Son of Mary. He came to share our humanity. We remember Jesus, whose name means Savior. He came to save his people from their sins. We hear his call to give him a place in our hearts. We light our Advent candles as a sign of our joy and hope. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. Through your word and spirit, may our souls be blessed. Please stand, we confess our sins and receive Christ's forgiveness. Beloved in the Lord, in the midst of the celebration of our born King, let us confess our sin and rely together on his divine mercy and grace. For the times we have, when we have decided that our ways are higher than your ways, O Lord, we confess our reluctance to relinquish control. We acknowledge that we have sought to steer our own course rather than trusting in you, O Lord. For the times we have ignored your calling to be present and committed to the family of Christ and to reflect your light in the world. We ask for your forgiveness, gracious God. Send your Holy Spirit to enlighten us and produce his fruit in our lives. In the face of uncertainty and change, when fear tempts us to put our trust in things other than you, O Lord, help us remember the abiding covenantal love you have for us in Jesus Christ and teach us to rest in your eternal promises. Let us embrace the humility that comes from knowing that we are not our own, but belong body and soul, in life and in death, to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. King of our hearts, align our will with yours, and grant us faith to live as your forgiven and beloved people in this world. Come, Lord Jesus. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We'll join and sing a Christmas hymn of praise. <laughs>
Let us pray. Almighty God, grant that the birth of your only Son in the flesh may set us free from our old bondage under the yoke of sin. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our first lesson for today is the prophecy that the king would be born. A prophecy from Micah chapter 5. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely. For then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace. The word of the Lord. A reading from Galatians chapter 4 that packages up for us Christmas. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. The word of the Lord. I want to invite you to sing the sermon hymns, one of the most important um, Christmas hymns ever written, still treasured today. Please sing as you feel comfortable.
gospel, which is the record of the life and work of Jesus from Matthew chapter 1. And I'm going to read it right in the center of the church as a symbol that Christ came as one of us for all of us. Please stand and you can turn and face me as we read here the record of, of the birth of Jesus from Matthew. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Try to ease you into this this morning. My wife and I have been on the lookout for a nativity scene, one that is beautiful enough and big enough that we think it gives a good witness to our faith in our neighborhood. And a couple of years ago, uh, my wife found one on Facebook, which should have been our first tip. It was coming out of Italy, and it looked beautiful. And she orders it up. It's inexpensive and everything, and it comes. And when it comes, she said to me, Jonathan, look at this. And it's 10 inches tall. Not quite the lawn ornament we were hoping for. Turns out it was a scam. So we're still on the lookout. If you find one that's really great, let us know. She almost found one this year. I turned it down. It was all white. And I thought, that's not going to work. We have too many white Christmases. It won't pop out. This scripture, this little story, it, it made me think about how and why I love nativity scenes. There's something so gentle about it, so right about it, so beautiful about it. All of creation is just the way it should be, staring at Jesus. It's, it's when we're at our most human, when we're praising God the way we should be, acknowledging him the way we should be. Mary and Joseph crane, the animals craning their necks, all, everybody, everybody's just gathering around Jesus. But I read the story and I think to myself, that's not the whole story though either. The nativity is not the whole story. It's, it's wilder than that. It's more undomesticated than I, I in, in fact, I was, I was actually planning I was planning to preach on this for Christmas Eve, and then it got too long, so I thought I'll slot it in on Christmas Day. I got a longer slot. And when I, when I, when, when I, when I made that decision, I felt relieved because people come on Christmas Eve with certain expectations, a certain, certain expectation for warmth. 
And this de-warms you. I know that's not a word. It's not domesticated. It's a wild Christmas. Because, because you look at it, and this is the story. The story of Jesus that's placed around it is the story of a man who thought that his wife had cheated on him. It's the story of of, of a young woman who almost became a single mom. It is almost the story of a broken family. And so, and so it's just like we've been in this sermon series. Some of you are, are jumping in on it, and that's great. I'm so glad you are. We've been in this sermon series, and I, I promise you that we're going to finish it up. We've been in this sermon series. What we've been doing is we've, we've been tracking Matthew's genealogy. We call this family tree. And what we have noticed all along the way, that this is, this is what's happening. Some of you know the line. We, we've, said, we've gone from, from male legal heir to male legal heir, and we've noticed this is expected, but five times, Five times Matthew interrupts us and unsettles us. Because he interrupts with five women. And we've looked at four of them so far, but then now we're picking up the fifth Mary. And her, see, her story does the same thing it unsettles you before it settles you. The story of how she almost became a single mom. The story of how her relationship all but broke. The question that I want to ask of you this morning is this, why? Matthew didn't have to tell us a story. He didn't have to tell us that this is how this went down. He didn't have to tell us. He tells us a story. Why? Is it because God is inviting each of you to a wilder, more undomesticated trust in God than ever ever before. Because here's the story. Right? Here's the story. They had had their plans. They had it all lined up. Mary was saying, Mary was saying to Joe, Hey, Joe, do you like these colors for our wedding? And Joe's eyes were glazing over. And she was saying, Hey, can you please talk to your mother about the guest list? We have got to get this thing nailed down. And then it all went dark. We know this from one of the other Gospels. One of the other writers is Luke. And Luke tells the story that Mary gets the news that she's pregnant by the Holy Spirit, and then she scuttles off. The language there is that she hurried to her relative Elizabeth's house. Why? Because she's scared. That's why. And she goes, she goes totally MIA. She's gone. And then she comes back. And Matthew, Matthew has the language. If you read it real carefully, Matthew has the language that tells you everything you need to know about it. Matthew says this. She was found. She was found to be with child. And that doesn't tell you a lot, but it tells you enough. See, she was discovered. Because see, it could have gone, it could have gone a different way. Here's what it doesn't say. It doesn't say Mary went and talked to him. It doesn't say that. It, said, it says she was found. She didn't, she didn't, she didn't take initiative. She didn't, go to, she didn't go to him and say, hey, Joe, an angel came, an angel said this. No. She was found. She was found. It makes you think about that, doesn't it? How? She comes back three months later. Joseph hugs her. Her body has changed. Did he, did he say something about it? 
Or was it when, you know, they went to Olive Garden and all of a sudden the waitress, the waitress, you know how waitresses, they always have to make this calculation. Is it pregnancy or is it something else? And finally the waitress comes out, it was so obvious. Congratulations, you're pregnant. Is that when Joseph finally said something? When it was undeniable, there's a baby bump. Did he say something right away? How did that go? It's implied, it's implied in the text. Joseph seems to know before the angel shows up in the dream. Mary's claim. How did it go? Hey, Mary. Mary, Mary, Joe, it's not what you think. I really did. So the angel, the Holy Spirit, I'm really all still yours. And Joseph said, I want to believe you. Mary, I want to believe you. I'm going to have to think about it. We know he did. This is, this is the story. It is, this is the story of how their plans were interrupted by God's plans. Here's something not everybody will tell you. The fact that God has plans for your life is the scariest thing in the world. That's an undomesticated truth for you. You'll find that out when you least want to. That it's not just you that has plans for your life, God does. Some of you, some of you already found that out irrevocably. It wasn't your plan that somebody died. It wasn't your plan that you're hurt right now. It wasn't your plan. It never was. You find that out sometimes at the worst times in life that your, your life has been ripped from your hands. It's not your plans. It's God's. And that's the scariest thing in the world until it becomes the best thing. I like what one pastor said about this story. Joseph's greatest disappointment, it turns out, was the greatest thing that ever happened to him. He just didn't know it yet. Joseph's Joseph's greatest disappointment, best thing that ever happened to him. He just didn't know yet. God has plans for your life. It's the scariest thing in the world. Also, the most comforting. That God, the British would say, has a bespoke plan for your life. And this invites you, doesn't it? It invites you to what the hymn we sang says in your fears and in your hopes. The hopes and the fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. When you're agonized like Joseph, God is calling you to a wilder trust. This too is God's plan, which turns out is the greatest plan for your life. He's calling you to a wilder, more undomesticated trust than ever before. It all does add up to Jesus. Is that why we get this story? (laughs) Or, 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 is it because Joseph is such an example of goodness here? He's so good. I, it's a precious little character sketch. Made all the more precious to me by a little word that Jesus once spoke from his cross. When he said to his mom, Woman, here is your son. Why did Jesus have to say that? You know why? Because Joseph was dead. Man of sorrows that he was, just like us, Jesus had to grieve. Joseph. Joseph was gone. We know that he was gone. He couldn't take care of Mary anymore. He was dead. Sometime during the the life of Jesus, he died. 
makes all, all, the, all this more precious that we get this little character sketch of the man who raised Jesus. What is he like? He's so good. He goes home and he thinks about it. He, what am I going to do with Mary? What am I going to do? He, he comes, he thinks that Mary's cheated on him. And what does he think? He says to himself, I can't out her publicly. I can't. I can't, I can't, I can't and I won't. I, I could. I have every right to go to the courts, to go public and say, that's not my baby. She's having a baby. It's not mine. He wouldn't. He said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going I'm to null it. I'm going to do this real quiet. It's going to be like we never were. Nobody will know. And he's so good. What it does, if you think about it, it pushes down goodness like three levels. Because a lot of us, we think of goodness. Here's what goodness is around Christmas time. Here's goodness. We give presents to our family and our friends. That's goodness. No, it's not. That is basic human decency. <laughs> that's what it is. It's basic human decency. You take care of your family. That is, that's not good. It's basic human decency. <laughs> here's, here's goodness. Here's Jesus. Jesus taught us what goodness actually is. He said it's better to, better to give than to receive, and he teaches us what that looks like. You want to give? Let's give, he says. He says, here's goodness. Give to somebody who can't repay you. That's why it's not great. It's, it's basic human decency to give to the family. Why? Because they'll give it right back. They're going to give it back in a smile, in a hug, in love, in time. In relationship, your family gives it right back. It's basic human decency. You want to do something that's good. You want to do something that's actually loving. Give to somebody. Jesus teaches you this. Give to somebody who can't repay you. And he has this list. I've got mine. Mine is kids. Kids cannot repay you. They can't hope to. You have given your life to them. Do you know what parents do on Christmas? They, they increase their kids' debt. That's what they do. You give more to the people who already can't repay you. You, you increase their debt. I have my list. Jesus has a better one. You want to know what goodness is? Give. To the poor, the blind, the lame, and the cripple. Because they'll never repay you. But Joseph, see Joseph, Joseph is one level down from that. He has even more goodness. It's not just people who can't repay you. Oh no, he goes deeper. He gives to somebody who has hurt him. Joseph gives an incredible Christmas gift to somebody who thinks, has, he thinks, has incredibly hurt him. I'm going to do what's best for her. I'm going to love her. Joseph is so good. All of this is the reminder as we look, we've looked at the ancestors of Jesus. We've called this family tree that, it's, that it's, it's totally a mixed bag, but it's not all bad. Yep, you got Judah and you got Tamar, but also you have David and Bathsheba, but also you got Joseph. And so we're reminded that the badness in humanity that we know about, it, it also shows us our badness. Because we look at badness in humanity and we go, that reflects me like a mirror. And so badness shows our badness. But Joseph reminds us this, that perhaps in even a greater way, goodness reveals our badness. Because we think we're good, until we actually look at what goodness is. So as the scriptures say, isn't it true that it is the light that reveals our darkness? Joseph is so good, he unmasks us at Christmas time. And what he does, if you think about it, is he, it, pushes, it pushes us to the one he was even more. To the one who gave to us though we could never repay him. 
the one who loved us though we were his enemies, though he lo lo loved us though we wounded him, Jesus. The stepson of Joseph. Is that why we get this story? So we can get a look at what goodness is. Is that why? Or is it actually so we can know God? There's, there's different, wrapping it up now, there's different metaphors that the Holy Spirit gives us to imagine our relationship with God. They're all enlightening. There's king and subject. There's lord and slave. There's creator and creation. There's sheep and shepherd. And all of these metaphors help us imagine our true relationship with God. But what might be the most favored metaphor to describe our relationship with God is this one. Husband and wife. Husband and wife. Did I say husband and wife? If you want to imagine your relationship with God, imagine a husband and a wife. Now, this is where I want to be kind of radical with, with Joseph and with, with the rest of the Holy Scriptures because here's what happens. It actually bugs me sometimes. Here's what happens. Here's what you hear on Christmas. You hear about, all about how God's love is for you. And then you are asked to think about what God's, what God's love is meant to do to your heart. But you know what the Scriptures often do? And nobody talks about it. It asks you not to think about what God's love does for you and to you. But instead, the scriptures ask you to think about this. What God's love for you does to him. Think about that. Because if you read the story, do you see what it's actually about? It is, this, it's actually the story of Joseph. It is the story of how his perceived, of his perception of Mary's infidelity makes him feel. It's the husband's side of the equation. Have you ever, have you, you th we think all the time about how God's love makes us and our hearts feel. Have you ever thought about how God's love makes him feel? in his heart, because the scriptures do that, and the prophets do that, and the story asks us to do that, the husband side of the equation. You know what the prophets say? Do you know what Moses says? It says that God's love makes him jealous. Do you, do you, want, to know what it, you, know, you want to know what it feels like to God when you don't pray? Imagine what it's like to have your wife stonewall you. And then you'll get it. That's what it's like when you don't pray. I mean, what is it like for God when you don't come home very much? It's like a husband whose wife doesn't come home at night. That's what it's like. What is it, what is it like for God when we have all our priorities in life? And he's not the one. Well, we call them our affairs for reason, I think. That's what it's like. God's love is jealous, the prophets say. And so we're told, we're told by all the prophets that God had a decision to make. What's he going to make? He had, this, he had the same decision that Joseph, what's he going to do with this woman? Except the difference was that Mary, what was in her was from the Holy Spirit, but what's in us is not. And God had a decision to make. And the prophets tell us that. What's he going to do? And the answer was, well, 
Christmas. Because here's the deal. God did for Joseph what he did for himself. Did you notice God did this? God did this, God sends the angel of the Lord. And what he does is he puts their relationship back together. Joseph, son of David, hint, hint, hint. You're the son of David. God does something with Davidic people. God is doing something in Mary. Joseph, hint, hint, hint. It's corroborating Mary's story. What's in her is, is from the Holy Spirit. And so what God did is God found a way to get Mary home for Christmas so that there wasn't a broken relationship and there wasn't a broken family. God found a way to get her home. God did that for Joseph and then God did that for himself. And I'm going to say this very, very carefully. How did he do it? What did God do at Christmas? He remarried us. If I could put it like that. He remarried us. Because in Mary, he put inside of her a new union. A union, a perfect union between God and God. In humanity, that's Jesus. In his one flesh. Do you hear marriage language in that? In his one flesh. God and man. God brought us back together. He remarried us. So that there's a, there's a new covenant with us and God. A new covenant, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. In sickness and in health, I'm going to get you home. God found a way to get us home, Martin Luther. In one of the most important writings outside of Christianity, he wrote a little piece called The Freedom of the Christian. He puts it like this about Christ and his bride, the church. He says, if he gives her his body and very self, how shall he not give her all that is his? And if he takes the body of the bride, how shall he not take all that is hers? It's talking about a union, a covenant. Jesus takes into himself our sin and he gives to us his righteousness. He takes our death and he gives us his life. He marries us in every sense of the word. So we can think about in the great song, what that means on our side. The great song in the Bible says this, my beloved is mine and I am his. But better, we can think about what God's love means for him because the song continues and it says this, God's love is jealous. And here's what it means. Death won't even end it because his jealousy is stronger for us than death. Nothing will stop God from having us. Nothing. Even if it means he has to raise us all from the dead. And that's Christmas. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that as the bridegroom, you have married us. Give us joy on this wedding day. Amen. Please stand, and we have a chance to think about the union between God and men, man in Christ. We're going to use um, a part of the Athanasian Creed here um, together. It is also necessary for everlasting salvation that one faithfully believe the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is the right faith that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is at the same time both God and man. He is God, begotten from the substance of the Father before all ages, 
And he is man, born from the substance of his mother in this age. Perfect God and perfect man, composed of a rational soul and human flesh, equal to the Father with respect to his divinity, less than the Father with respect to his humanity. Although he is God and man, he is not two, but one Christ. One, however, not by the conversion of the divinity into flesh, but by the assumption of the humanity into God. One altogether, not by confusion of substance, but by unity of person. For as the rational soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ, who suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose again the third day from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, God Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. This is the true Christian faith. Whoever does not believe it faithfully and firmly cannot be saved. Please be seated. Uh, and at this time, the offering plates will come around. If you do have something that you want to share on one of those connection cards, um, you can share with us prayer requests, your information to get a once a week email or something like that. You are welcome to do that at this time. Please stand. Joining our voices with the song of the angels, let us pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. The shepherds sing, Jesus Christ is born. Let your church throughout the world proclaim this news over the hills and everywhere. Unite the voices of all your faithful people in songs of praise and rejoicing. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Heaven and nature sing joy to the world. Give respite to flocks, fields, and those who tend them. Come near to us in the beauty of nighttime, the shining of the stars, and the hush of a world at rest. May our wonder at your creation rouse our care for all the earth. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. The angels sing peace on earth. Come quickly to still the strife of this world. Hush the noise of war and violence in places of unrest. Inspire leaders of nations to seek lasting peace and sustainable provision for all in their care. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Mary sings melodies of comfort to her newborn child. Bring rest and reassurance to those facing struggles. Shelter travelers and those without homes. Console those who lie awake due to pain or anxiety. Heal those who are sick or hurting. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Love sings through the sound of a new, new baby's cry. Bless new parents and expectant parents. Comfort those who long for children. 
especially those running out of hope or options. Surround families of every shape and size with your love and care. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. The heavenly chorus sings glory to God in the highest. We give you thanks for all the saints who have proclaimed your glory in word and deed. Let us join them this holy day in joyful praise around your eternal throne. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of mercy, come quickly to us with grace upon grace as we lift these and all our prayers to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. And we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whose wonderful and mysterious birth you have opened our eyes to the glory of your grace and renewed in our hearts the fervor of your love. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen.
Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Children of God, today you have come with the shepherds to see what mighty things God has done. To us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government is upon his shoulders. He is wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. So now go, hurry, Proclaim on the mountains, on the streets, in your homes, and in your neighborhoods these good tidings that you have seen and pondered. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. We will close today uh, by singing um, a beautiful Christmas hymn, Go Tell It on the Mountain.
Merry Christmas to you all. Uh, God be with you, give you joyful hearts. Christ has come for you um, to give you the greatest peace. Have a great Christmas day. Thanks for being here.